What's up, Bay? For today's video, we're gonna cover how to make this variable font weight hover effect in Webflow with GSAP. This code comes from Julian Fella, who I found on LinkedIn, and he just has this silky smooth variable font hover with GSAP. I changed the code a little bit myself. I wanted to use module syntax. I found some stuff we could delete, and I also wanted to do less math. So let's go ahead and jump in how to do that. Hey there, Web Bay. For this project, we're gonna start in Webflow looking at variable fonts and how to add the script to our page. Then we're going to go about setting up the match media GSAT function, which is just going to run this code on the desktop breakpoint and above because it doesn't really make sense to have a hover effect on a touch device. Next, we'll select the DOM elements that we need in our code. For step four, we'll split the text into characters using the split type library. And then we'll do some math on the mouse move. So as the mouse moves, we'll get some coordinates on where the mouse is and we'll relate that to different characters. And finally, for step six, we'll animate the font weight based on the results of our math. So let's hop into Webflow and see how this gets started. The only thing to cover in Webflow is the H1 that says hover here, thank me later, with this custom data attribute data animate equals font weight. This is how we're going to select this DOM element in our code. And speaking of our code, if we come to the page settings, you'll see that up here in the head, I'm loading a script type module just being served from my local development server. But when you get this clonable, I will go ahead and stick the code right in here. All right, now let's get started with this code. Now you already see that I'm importing GPack from the Skypack CDN as well as split type. Now GSAP is our animation library and split type is a library that takes any text element that we give it and can split it up into words or characters or lines so that then we can animate those. Anyways, the next thing we're going to do is listen for the DOM content loaded event. We don't necessarily need to have this because this is a script type module and it's going to fire after this event anyways, but I commonly wrap all my code in this expression right here because it creates an anonymous function right here to execute once this event fires. And what that does is it creates a closure for all the variables and functions that we're going to define now and prevents us from polluting the global namespace. If you wanna get smart on this JavaScript stuff like higher order functions, and closure and global namespace, check out my JavaScript course in Patreon, which is only $20 a month. Each module has its own Webflow project associated with it. We can see down here, so here's module two. If I click show more, you'll see that you actually in the module before, I'm gonna load more here. We have functions where we learn how to write a format time and count up to function, which we then use to build this stopwatch sort of thing. This is one of the very first lessons in the course, but I just wanna highlight the things that we're talking about here. We're talking about these math.min and math.floor methods. And we also have closures function that return functions, recursion, the call stack. So just really deep dive into all this whimsical JavaScript stuff. You should check it out. Let's start with our match media instance. This is the thing that we're going to use to make sure that this only runs on desktop on devices that have a mouse, so not touch devices. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the GSAP match media function and store that in a variable called MM, which of course stands for match media. Now what we can do is we can add a media query using the mm.add method, and then we'll pass the string min width of 992 pixels. This is saying that, hey, run this code on anything that's 992 pixels or above. And the stuff that we want to run is defined in this anonymous function right here. So we're creating even another closure here with this anonymous function. And inside of this is where we want to define the rest of our logic. So we're going to create this variable font weight items, and we're going to use the query selector all method here. And what we want to select is anything with that data animate equal to font weight attribute. So say we have multiple items of these on the page right now, we only have one, but we're using query selector all, which will get everything with this attribute on there. And it will store this in a node list, which we can then iterate over and perform animations on each one. Next, we'll define some constant variables. That's why they're all caps here. I don't ever expect these to change but you could change them if you want to customize this to your animation. So max distance is equal to 300, we'll say 300 pixels. The max font weight will be 800, so this is the boldest that our fold can get. And then we have a min font weight of 100. And then we'll go ahead and split up the text with the data attribute. To do this, we'll call a for each function on our font weight items. And now for each is a higher order function, which means we're gonna input a function here. So we give that a function definition, and that gets access to each individual item within that node list created by query selector all, and we'll run our code in this closure right here. So we've got another closure in a closure, and you can see that stacking up down here, right? We've got closures on closures. Anyways, we're gonna go ahead and call the split type constructor here. And what that takes is the item itself. So that is the item within our font weight items node list here. And we're going to specify options. And in this case, we wanna specify the type here, and that type is characters. So we're just breaking things up into characters, and then we're calling the dot characters property on that object returned by the split type 
constructor. Now we'll actually get started on our animation that we've set up all of our elements for this. For the mouse move event listener, we just listen for the mouse move event, and then we specify another function to execute on that event. And what we want to do is we want to get the mouse position to start, and we can get that off of the event by calling event.pageX and event.pageY. So now we have the X and the Y coordinates of the cursor on our page. And next we need to check the position of every character on the page and compare that to our cursor X and Y. So let's go ahead and iterate over font weight items again. So we'll call each item there. And we're going to query selector all each character. And we're going to call for each on each character and run another function in there. So functions on functions in here. And then we're gonna get the center of each character and calculate the distance to the cursor. To get the position of these elements on the page, we can call the get bounding client rect function. The get bounding client rect function we can see returns a DOM rect type, which is basically just an object with X, Y, width and height, and just all the information about each individual DOM element on the page, where it exists and where it's rendered. So those X, Y coordinates. And now let's store that center point by doing a little bit of math. So we'll say item center X, is equal to the item rect left property plus the width divided by two plus the amount the user has scrolled. For item center y, we'll do the exact same thing, but we'll start from the item rect top. We'll add the height, divide that by two, and then add the scroll y as well. Next, we'll calculate the distance. Now this uses the good old a squared plus b squared equals c squared, which we use by saying math.square root of math.power of this mouse x minus item center, and we're raising it to the second power here, and then we're also adding math.power of mouse y minus item center raised to the second power. So now we have our distance. We can do even a little bit more math to figure out how close it is to that max distance constant that we defined earlier, and also how much the font weight should change based on that. And GSAP actually comes with a really handy utility function to let us do this. It's called map range. And what it's designed to do is it's designed to take into inputs, say, Say you give it like zero and one, but you wanna map the values between zero and one to something between zero and 100. So if I give you a value of 0.5, the map range function would spit out a value of 50. And we're also going to chuck this all in a ternary, which means if a condition is satisfied, then set a variable to one condition, otherwise set it to another condition. You'll see it here right now. So let's define a variable font weight, and we're gonna set that equal to a value if the distance is less than the max distance. So we only wanna use this map range function if our distance that we calculated right here is less than our max distance constant value. And now a ternary, we chuck a little question mark on here, and that says if this value is true, then store this value into this variable. So you can see I've got gsap.utils.mapRange here, and now this takes five parameters. Let's go through them right now. So we'll start with zero, and we wanna go to max distance, and we'll map that to our min font weight and our max font weight. And we also need an input value, which is our distance, or in this case, our max distance minus the distance. And we'll just take the max of that or zero just so that we don't have any negative numbers here. And so what this is doing, again, I'm just going to repeat, we're taking this range, so zero to max distance, which is 300, and this range, which is 100 to 800, and we're basically interpolating whatever this value ends up being to be whatever the right distance is between our min font weight of 100 and our max font weight of 800. So we'll get anything between 100 and 800 and spit that into font weight if this condition is true. Otherwise, and now we specify the otherwise with this colon right here, we're just gonna set it to the minimum font weight, which is of course 100. Now, okay, that was the hard part, that was the math. Now we can actually perform our animation with gsap.2. So we use our gsap.2 function here, and that takes two arguments. It takes the element to animate and the properties to animate. So we're going to animate the character, which again, we have up here because we're looping over each individual character in our for each loop here. And then we're specifying our options object here. And we want to animate our font weight to a value of the font weight. And we can just have shorthand syntax here, notation in JavaScript, if we just said font weight is equal to font weight like that but we don't need to do that because the variable name and the property name are the same here. And we can specify the duration of 0.5 seconds. This stuff in here inside of these brackets is called tween variables in GSAP language. Anyways, that's all it takes. Now we can save and load and we get our wonderful animation. So that's it for this animation. Thank you so much to Julian for presenting this. I took some of his code and rewrote it. I got rid of jQuery, like I said. I did a little less math and opted to use the GSAP map range function and just a couple other things there.